Getting the exposure to grow your small wedding business can be difficult. With millions of engaged couples using The Knot to plan their weddings and find vendors, advertising on our sites will connect you with more couples than anywhere else online. Meet engaged couples where they're already searching for vendors like you. And let us deliver leads to help you grow your business. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast to sign up today. Mention code PODCAST15 during your free onboarding session for 15% off your first month. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 246, The End of the Aleutian Campaign. Last time, we left off with the start of Operation Landcrab, the Allied effort to retake the islands of Kiska and Attu, which was launched on May 11, 1943. General Buckner's attempts of bombing the enemy into leaving, nor the naval blockade, had produced the desired results. Hence, it was to be boots on the ground. And even though Kiska was in between the U.S. mainland and Attu, it was decided to land on Attu first, thus cutting off the Japanese on Kiska from launching further raids, as they would now have to be focused solely on defense. As the Americans, with Canadian help, controlled the skies and waters, the entrenched Japanese on either island would not receive reinforcements. Still, on Attu, they had some 2,900 men, who were all ordered to hold to the last. As we have seen, the 12 or so thousand allies approached the Japanese position on the northeast corner of Attu from two different directions. The forces met up and began pushing the Japanese north, back to their base at Attu village, alongside Chicago Harbor. By May 26, there was one last height the Japanese could use for defense, a rocky ridge called Fishhook, and they used it well. For two more days, the Americans were held up and bloodied. But that was about to change. As the situation stood, the Allies were facing a cliff above them, with scattered units of Japanese troops, all relatively safe, within their trenches. The downward gunfire of the Japanese, as well as the grenades they lobbed over the edge, was creating more casualties for the Americans. But then... 23-year-old private Joseph P. Martinez, who had been a sugar beet farmer in Ohio just 10 months earlier, had had enough. He wasn't much of a talker. Instead, he preferred to be doing. So, standing up, he opened fire on the closest enemy position, his gun at his hip, as he had been trained, and then ran up the hill. Bullets were almost immediately coming at him, yet some of the enemy did not fire. They were too amazed at his bravery or insanity. After getting himself on a rock where he could look down on some of the enemy, Martinez continued firing, and one by one, the closest enemy troops to him started going down. He had a bag of grenades with him, but that would have taken too long to access, pull the pin, and then throw. No, he just kept shooting with his Browning automatic rifle or bar. All this had occurred in seconds, but then the inevitable happened. Martinez himself went down. During this exchange, some of the Japanese troops had the wherewithal to throw grenades down at the enemy, thus keeping them pinned down from helping the brave private. However, as Martinez had killed the five closest enemy troops to him, a hole was now opened up in their line on fishhook. Martinez's comrades then themselves ran up the hill. Most fired on the enemy, but Sergeants Earl Marks and Glenn Swearingen tried to reach Martinez, but they could not, yet they could see his body. They assumed he was dead, but then his hand moved. The guy was still alive. The two amazed sergeants crawled the rest of the way to the wounded man and could see that he had been hit through the edge of his helmet. Swergen took off his coat and placed it over Martinez, but as they were still pinned down, it was impossible to get him to a field hospital. 
The men of Company K of the 32nd Infantry were now enthused with hope, so resupplied themselves with grenades and went further up the hill. But darkness came before any real advancement could be made. Snow soon followed the dark. When morning came, the lead elements of K Company realized that the enemy had left the heights. As for Martinez, he had died during the night. He would be awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously, the highest honor for heroism. Further, Joe Martinez would be the first private to earn that distinction, and the only one, during the Battle of Etu. As things stood now, the Allies were looking down on the last Japanese position, itself devastated by American and Canadian air power. They had little food, no protection, and because of the American blockade, no chance for help, though a submarine fleet had tried to evacuate them. And this being the case, a PBY flew over the ruined camp, dropping leaflets, telling the Japanese what they already knew. Their chances were hopeless, and that they should surrender. But for Colonel Yasuyo Yamasaki, surrender was out of the question. So he had to find the possible within the impossible. The colonel gathered his officers and issued his orders. If this worked, every enemy soldier on a two would be dead soon. If not, then they would all be dead. This was the military's idea of how to serve the emperor. As the meeting broke up, the Japanese doctors went back to their wounded, but the other officers burnt all their papers. Orders that had been radioed in, situation reports, composed from the first moments they arrived on Attu. Meanwhile, the doctors visited each of their patients. If they were seriously wounded, lethal doses of morphine were administered. However, if the patient was cognizant, they were handed a hand grenade. They knew what was expected of them in following the Bushido Code. By 1800 that evening, 6 p.m., all of the patients that had been giving hand grenades had pulled the pin and held the device either to their chest or head. At 3 a.m., on the morning of May 29th, Colonel Yamasaki and all able-bodied men reloaded what guns they had, gathered the last of their grenades, ate up the last of their rice, and moved out towards the Allied line. The first Americans they came upon were standing in the middle of Chicagoff Valley. As these were the lookouts, the Japanese quickly and quietly brought them down with bayonets. Next, the Japanese troops moved on to the enemy soldiers sleeping nearby in foxholes. These Americans were taken out the same way. Thus far, the Japanese had made no sound. Now that the perimeter guards were taken out, as were their comrades, the Japanese, led by Colonel Yamasaki, with his samurai sword in his hand, made a dash for the tented community of the enemy. Only now do they start screaming and using their guns. We die, you die too, was all they said, over and over. Yamasaki's plan was simple, but brilliant. As he had around 1,500 men with him, some of them would charge straight for the enemy's artillery, capture it, and then turn it on the Americans in other positions to cause confusion. Meanwhile, the majority of the attackers would first make for Engineer Hill on the north end of the eastern ridge of Massacre Valley, so-called as Russians had butchered natives there decades ago. After the Japanese troops had re-equipped themselves with American guns and ammunition, they would make for the enemy's food supply. If all worked according to plan, the Japanese would strike terror into the enemy, hopefully forcing them back south, while the attackers would have a new lease on life with food and guns. The 800 or so men with Colonel Yamasaki reached the base of Engineer Hill, chaos in their wake. Without hesitating, they started running up the hill, throwing grenades into foxholes, and shooting or stabbing those who got in their way. Their progress was slowed as the Americans became aware of what was happening. 
but the Japanese continued their advance. Soon, the Japanese, though grabbing the weapons of dead or wounded GIs, ran out of bullets. The fighting de-evolved into hand-to-hand combat, which lasted for hours in the darkness. The American hospital tent was soon full of wounded, but then some of the enemy troops made it there, tore a hole in the tent side, and threw in what few grenades they had left. What Yamasaki could not know, but could probably guess at, was that there were no combat troops on Engineer Hill. Just engineers. Bulldozer drivers, cooks, staff officers, and supply haulers. Still, they grabbed their weapons and resisted as best they could. Their hope was to hold out long enough for the infantry to come to their aid. But the darkness made that all but impossible. When morning came, blood and bodies were everywhere, covering the sides of Engineer Hill, as the Japanese had spread out in the mayhem. Very few Americans were left alive there. Hardly any of the survivors were without wounds. With the sunlight, the Americans better organized their response and continued to send men up the hill to kill the remaining enemy. But the fighting was not over yet, as the Americans learned that some of the enemy went after different positions. Yet, by nightfall of May 29th, the fighting did come to an end. Colonel Yamasaki was dead, and most of the men who had been with him that were still alive took their own lives, rather than fall into enemy hands. The majority of them died by holding up their last grenade to their head. The American boys, either in their teens or early 20s, would come upon horrendous sights. Ironically, some of the few Japanese survivors, numbering only 29 out of the nearly 2,680 men, were either orderlies, civilian laborers, or those that had spent time in the United States and had come to value their lives more than serving the emperor. A two was back in American hands, but the cost had been high, not only from fighting the enemy, but from being unprepared for the conditions and having the arrogance to think that this would only be a three-day battle. Of the more than 15,000 U.S. soldiers, 549 were killed in action. Another 1,148 were wounded, with 1,200 more having suffered seriously from the cold. Two days later, May 31st, the Japanese government put out a statement. It is assumed the entire Japanese force has preferred death to dishonor. True enough, but there was still the island of Kiska. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History, wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. It would take the Allies some time to get ready to invade Kiska, codenamed Operation Cottage. First, they wanted to practically double the number of troops going in 
considering the bloodbath of Atu. Next, it was time to bring in men specifically trained in rock climbing and skiing. Hence, the Army's 87th Mountain Infantry, 10th Division, would be crammed aboard the USS Zelin and taken to Adak, and thence to Kiska. As these troops had never been in battle before, they were most anxious of landing on Kiska. Tokyo Rose didn't help, which was the point, when she told them over the radio, All you boys on the Zelin heading for Kiska Island, there's a big surprise waiting for you. Which was true enough, but it would be the Japanese who first received a surprise that to this day has never fully been explained. After Atu fell, but before Kiska was invaded, on July 26, 1943, the Japanese listening posts at Vega Point, on the southwest end of Kiska, picked up American signals. But what was strange was that it wasn't in code, but plain English. Also, Japanese troops on Kiska could see intense flashes of light to the west of the island. The translators on the radios simply wrote down what was overheard, noted the intensity of the person's voice, and sent it up the chain of command. The event the intelligence officer reported on, the event itself, and the Japanese reaction to it would affect the lives of every soldier currently on Kiska. The U.S. Army's 87th Mountain Infantry left San Francisco three days later. By early August 1943, the 34,000 invasion force, which included 5,300 Canadians from the 13th Infantry Brigade, was ready to sortie. But landing first early in the morning of August 15th would be the acclimated Kastner's cutthroats. They would land just below the center of the island on the southern shore at Gertrude Cove. Then they would travel south quietly killing any and all enemy scouts they encountered. Yet, if they were detected, it was all to the good, as in, it would make the Japanese believe that this was the main invasion force. In fact, the first wave to come ashore would do so north of the Japanese position at Vega Point on the southern tip. Only when dawn opened up on August 15th did the first wave of the regular Allied force come ashore. They were to follow the advance scouting party and ready the cliff in front of them for the second wave by cutting stairs into the sides of the heights. The men of the 10th Mountain were scared as they had not been in combat before and had heard of the fields of Engineer Hill, covered in dead. Having 34,000 troops to invade was one thing, but that would not help the first or second waves going in. Many spent the night before going ashore writing their probable last letters to their loved ones. For the first few hours of the morning, the Allies, nor Kastner's cutthroats, had run into enemy positions. It was assumed that after Atu, the Japanese were well dug in at Vega Point to the south, which helped ease the nerves of the men Yet they knew the real fighting would be underway, and soon. Sure enough, around noon, the first stretcher came back down the ridge, where shooting could be heard. As the fog was thick, the men climbing off the boats and wading onto shore would suddenly come upon four of their own, carrying a corpse. Still, there was a job to do, and so the Americans and Canadians made for the height, to access it at different points. The fighting that day was not very heavy. Again, the majority of the waiting Japanese must have been holed up somewhere further south. Still, the casualties started coming in. That night brought wind, rain, and more fog. The men sank down into their foxholes and tried not to think of silent Japanese soldiers rushing at them with their bayonet coming in first, expectant. When the sun rose the next day, August 16th, there were 15 Allied dead. All things considered, and certainly by the standards of Atu, things were going pretty well. Ground was being covered, 
Yet it dawned on the Americans and Canadians that they had yet to see a Japanese body. Were they dragging away their dead to hide their numbers? That made little sense, but so did almost everything else about this, where one could only see ten feet in front of them because of the fog. Fearing that this would turn into another Atu, an intelligence and reconnaissance unit was sent out to the south. Basically, their job was to keep walking until they were shot at by the enemy. That way, the brass knew where the enemy were. So, technician 5th class Robert Parker set out with the other men. They walked and walked, coming upon nothing, but were tense the whole time. Then finally, they saw in the distance an enemy artillery installation. As it was their job to gather information, they crept closer and closer, waiting for the bullets to start flying. But nothing happened. Soon, they were walking within the installation. Then it hit them. No one was here, not one Japanese soldier. Not here, not further south, not anywhere on Kiska. When this was confirmed by further patrols, it had to be reported that 17 dead Americans and their wounded and four dead Canadian soldiers and their wounded were mostly killed by friendly fire. A few had died by Japanese booby traps, but fear and anticipation had done the rest. The GIs and Canadians had just learned another lesson about war. Going back to the night of July 26th, three weeks before the Allies landed on Kiska, when the American radio signals had been picked up in plain English, some of the American ships had been pulled out of the naval ring around Kiska. For radar showed that sizable blips, or pips as they were called, during the early days of radar, were approaching the island. As these were not American ships, it must be that the enemy was attempting to evacuate their men from Kiska. However, the Japanese, more specifically Rear Admiral Matsatomi Kumura, whose very job it was to evacuate the men, and was some 500 miles south of Kiska, knew it was not ships of the Empire. The pips that were picked up were some 80 miles west of the island. Either way, the battleships Mississippi and Idaho along with their escorts, were pulled away from Kiska and sent west. Getting into position, several dozen tons of shells were sent at the pips, as the fog and mist were so thick, nothing could be visually confirmed. After using up much of their stocks, the U.S. battleships moved in, yet found no debris, nor bodies, nor oil slick. It seems that the enemy had somehow survived the hailstorm of shells, and had gotten clean away. But as the two battleships had used up much of their fuel in moving to different firing positions, they were now in need of refueling, which meant the gap they left in the blockade around Kiska would remain, but only for a little while longer. However, this bit of news was also shared over the radio and picked up by the Japanese. Admiral Kimura, his fleet consisting of destroyers and cruisers, ignored orders to be conservative with his fleet, slowly approached Kiska from the south, where the line was thinned out by the absence of the two battleships. Kimura also chose courses that were considered dangerous, thus he was even less likely to be engaged by the Americans. Using a radio beacon, the fleet met up with the 5,000 Japanese soldiers on Kiska. Within 55 minutes, all concerned were well motivated, the beach was empty of troops. With Atu recaptured and Kiska abandoned by the Japanese, on August 21, 1943, just days after the Americans and Canadians had been accidentally shooting at each other, both FDR and Canadian Prime Minister W. L. Mackenzie King issued a joint statement. The Aleutian War, that we now know as the Forgotten War, was over. 
Yet Radio Tokyo, in keeping the PR war going, stated that, in fact, the Japanese had not been on Kiska since late July. Washington countered that Japanese anti-air forces were on the island as late as August 13th, which was not the case. Postscript William Charles Charlie House was taken to the Ofuna camp near Yokohama. The camp's nickname was the Torture Farm. As Charlie was a part of the United States Navy, he was the enemy. In Japan, though it had signed the Geneva Conventions, the Japanese government, per the military, had not ratified it. The conventions covered, among other things, the basic treatment of prisoners of war. By 1944, the Aleutian people, though technically not called prisoners by the Japanese, along with the Allied POWs, began to starve. Between droughts and the ever-shrinking food supply, resources were saved for the Japanese people and their soldiers. The youngest and oldest of the prisoners began to die of starvation. Chief Mike Hodakoff and his son George died in January of 1945, having eaten fish heads from the garbage. After the war, in an interview, Charlie Howe said, I don't think I could have survived another winter as a POW in Japan. The atomic bomb saved my life, and that of the 146,000 other Allied POWs in Japan, which included 108,000 British and Imperial troops, 23,000 Dutch, and 15,000 Americans. If there had been an invasion, the Japanese would have killed every one of us. As for Charlie's weather team, they all survived, as did their dog, whose name was Explosion. When Etta Jones, the schoolteacher of Atu, returned home, she only weighed 80 pounds, the same amount as Charlie, after losing 100 pounds when he gave himself up to the Japanese. As for the Battle of the Pips, the mystery was never fully solved. However, many years later, it was believed by some, after talking with modern Aleutian fishing boat captains, that the images on the radar were caused by large groups of migrating seabirds rusting on the water, called the short-tailed shearwater, or, as the Australians know it, the mutton bird. It migrates each July and passes through the Aleutians. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So I just wanted to let you know that on the next episode, I'll thank all the new members, people who have donated, people who have bought coffee mugs. I just wanted to get this episode out as soon as I can. And indeed, if you wanted to support the show by becoming a member, you can find everything at uh, worldwar2podcast.net. You sign up, I send you the password, and I would really appreciate it. We're currently doing a series of shows on a serial killer who was loose and occupied Paris. And for you members out there, one, thank you very much for supporting me. And just know that next week I will be putting out several shows. In fact, the first one will be out in a couple days because I'm working hard on that. So thank you for your patience. Um, so again, I'll thank everyone later. However, I did want to let Professor Michael F. Bird, an Australian theologian and New Testament scholar, who is one of the academics in Cameron's documentary, Inventing the Messiah, I just wanted to let him know that I got your message through Cam, that the first Nazi tanks that were defeated on land, obviously, and that the first time the Japanese were defeated on land were by Aussies, meaning Tobruk and Milne Bay. So, Professor Mike, got your message received, sir, and thank you to all the Australians out there. So now that we finished with this little Aleutian interlude, haha, it is time to get back to Pearl Harbor. <laughs>